Okay, this is lecture one, introduction. Um, the first thing I want to make sure you remember, probably from intro, is the different professional organizations. ACR stands for American College of Radiology. And this is an organization for imaging professionals mostly radiologists will, will look at these standards, um, who standardize imaging modalities in order to make safe, effective, and accessible to those who need it. So the ACRs, again, at the American College of Radiology, so most of the time radiologists are going to refer to the standards set by the ACR. Now the AIUM is specific to ultrasound. It's the American Institute for Ultrasound and Medicine. And the function of the AIUM serves to advance the science and art of ultrasound in medicine and research. The SCMS is another ultrasound specific organization, it stands for Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography. They serve to promote, advance, and educate their members as well as the medical community. Okay, so they put out educational, um, <clears throat> whether it be journals or lectures or conferences, but they serve to educate um, its members. So for example, after you get your registry, it is up to you to continue getting CMEs, continuing medical education credits. Um, you need 30 in a triennium. So typically, I try to get 10 a year. And if you're a member of the STMS, um, they'll have, and we did this last month, those 10 question quizzes and so forth, you can get a credit for completing one of those and passing it. So they put out all kinds of education and help support members uh, so they can get their CMEs. Now, the ARDMS stands for American Registry of Diagnostic Medical Sonographers. They conduct certifying examinations. So this is where you're going to go when you want to sign up for your SPI to ensure competency of sonographers in their specialized fields. And it maintains a list of these qualified sonographers. So um, once you get registered, you're going to be in a, a, a bank stored on their website so Ms. Piper usually goes in there and, and she can see if you've taken your test, if you've passed your test, if you're registered and so forth. JCO, um, Joint Commission of Accredited Health Organizations. This is not specific to ultrasound. This is a committee that regulates and improves healthcare institutions in order to ensure safe and efficient patient care. So, for example, when our accreditation, when you've probably heard this before, when they come to check on us, um, it's JCO that would give us our, um, I guess you would call it a certificate um, when we actually meet all the guidelines for accreditation. Now, ergonomics is maintaining correct body posture and transducer handling to minimize um, risks associated with scanning, things like carpal tunnel, uh, things like that. So there are ergonomic chairs, tables, and equipment. Um, so you can adjust that to the proper height and position so that you're not putting too much stress on your body. Uh, you want to use proper body mechanics when moving patients and equipment. And you want to make sure that you have proper room readiness prior to having the page, patient come in so they don't have to um, finagle them around the room and move chairs and, and tables and so forth. And we have some of these in our lab. We have these chairs as well as we have the armbands. And again, that's to take some of the pressure of the cord off of you. Infection control is really important. Um, there's been a lot of staph infections um, at local hospitals lately, and 
of course, with this pandemic, there's there's obviously been a change in the way we do things, although we should have been doing this all along. But you always need to wash your hands before and after exams. Always wear gloves while performing exams. Use proper probe covers, um, not just endocapital probes, but whenever needed. If you're using a linear array and the patient has an open wound or they might have scabies or something um, <clears throat> contagious, so you want to always cover the probe when it's appropriate. Clean all transducers after every patient. So not just the endocapital transducers, but all of them. And transducers that are contaminated, obviously, with blood or bodily fluids, they need to be disinfected. Now, there is a high-level disinfectant call that um, can be performed by a Trophon machine. And most places are going to want you to get Trophon certified. There is a link in this PowerPoint that brings you to that site. And if you sit through um, the presentation and then take the exam, you can get certified um, before you even go out on your clinicals. So that's something that you might want to do. <clears throat> so of course, we've got gloves, tea spray, things like that, probe covers. Now, Cydex is a disinfectant. Um, some places, they still do this. They'll just soak the probe. Um, that has been contaminated with blood or, or fluids in Cydex. Um, most disinfectants like Cydex do require that you activate them first, and they also have an expiration date. Um, must be tested daily with test strips to make sure it's still effective. Uh, soaking times are going to vary. It depends on what kind of disinfecting you're using. So again, you're going to read the container. Um, with things like Cydex, you're going to need some ventilation because they have a very strong odor, and it may require deactivation um, before disposing of it. And these are some of the different container comes in. We usually dilute them and so forth. <clears throat> now, the Trophon 2, and that HLD stands for High Level Disinfectant, this uses um, like a really strong hydrogen peroxide, and you basically place the transducer in there for, and I believe, I don't know, I don't want to tell you wrong, but when you go to the website, it tells you exactly how many minutes to put it in there, and everything's electronic, and it'll prompt you on how to do that. But you, through this lecture, you can't click on, on this link, but when you go through week one on the PowerPoints, I would click on Trophon 2. HLD and it will bring you right to the website. And like I said, it's a good idea to get to get the certification before you even go out on your clinicals. Ultrasound gel used to eliminate air between the skin surface and the transducer to promote transmission. Um, obviously, you don't want people to be allergic to it, so we want to use something that's safe and doesn't cause breakouts. Um, it should be the proper temperature. We don't want it too warm so that it doesn't get um, bacteria. We want to make sure that we clean gel bottles with hot water and soap if we're going to refill them. Be careful not to let the tip of the bottle ever touch your patient's skin or the transducer surface. Forming exams. Okay. Now, your quizzes are going to be what appears to be very simple, but I caution you not to, uh, to definitely study, to not get uh, too lazy and think, oh, I think I know this because it seems like common sense. But there's important things that you have to do before each exam. First of all, you have to verify the physician's order to make sure there actually is an order for it, not just trusting the nurse that told you that we're going to do a DVT study. You've got to make sure that you check and see the physician's order. And then there has to be an indication, why are we doing this? And that's your job to look for that before you even start the exam. Otherwise, it's going to come back on you, and they're going to ask you why you did it. You know, and you can't just say, well, the nurse told me to, because you have to verify that stuff. Check for um, any relevant imaging that was done prior to this and lab tests, because that's going to help you get a better idea of what they're probably looking for. You need to confirm the patient's identification. Now, sometimes they can answer. 
Um, and sometimes even when you go out to the waiting room and you call, you know, say Mrs. Smith, sometimes somebody else will get up and you'd be amazed at how um, things can get confusing. So you want to kind of confirm the patient more than once and make sure you have the right person, get their birth date and all of that stuff. Um, and also ask them what exam we're doing and why. Verify correct exam prep. Make sure that they're prepped for the exam. Some require that they're MPOs. Some require a full bladder, things like that. Ask patient for a description of their symptoms and pertinent medical history, like if they've had any kind of surgery. Well, we don't need to know every surgery, but if, if you're doing an abdomen and you see a big uh, scar on their abdomen, it's for gallbladder, and you might want to ask them if they have a gallbladder. Because sometimes um, they've had it removed and we're actually, they ordered that study. So you need to ask questions. Patient prep for abdominal scans. Uh, if you're doing a complete abdomen or a right upper quadrant, a minimum of eight hours of fasting is necessary. So they have an eight to 12 hour window MPO unless it's ordered stat. If something's ordered stat for the ER, whether they ate or not, you need to to try and make an attempt to do that scan. Renal MPO is not necessary, but if they're coming in and it's not an emergency, I would tell my patients to just be well hydrated, but not to eat, but to drink a lot of water. And the reason I would tell them to do that is so that um, I'd be able to see that inferior pole of the kidney without that much bowel gas, and the kidneys will be nice and hydrated, so they should be easy to scan if they're drinking water in their MPO. Uh, but you need to know technically it is not necessary, okay? The urinary bladder, um, you should have your patient drink about 20 ounces of a clear fluid one hour prior to exam, and then, of course, hold it and do not void. Abdominal Doppler imaging, about 8 to 12 hours MPO, and you're probably going to do pre- and post-parandel scans, again, unless it's ordered stat. The aorta, that's my dog dreaming. Um, 8 to 12 hours MPO, unless ordered stat. Patient prep for GYN and OB exams. Transabdominal pelvis, about 32 ounces of a clear fluid, one hour. Bella. Hey, hey, wake up. One hour prior to the exam, uh, and do not void. Transvaginal pelvis. You actually want them to void and make sure they have an empty bladder for that exam. Transabdominal OB, about 20 ounces of fluid. Again, the baby's there, so they're already going to be uncomfortable. Their bladder's going to feel full, even if it's not. So about 20 ounces should be enough. And this way, um, and sometimes we want to do transabdominal because we want to evaluate the cervix. So that would be the reason for that. And then, of course, you end up doing an, a transvaginal OB. We just have them empty their bladder. So... It's going to depend on, a, you know, what you're trying to do. Patient prep for a scrotal ultrasound. We want to have our patient remove everything from the waist down. Um, we're going to give them some kind of a gown to cover up. Um, they should be lying supine with rolled towels placed under the scrotum between the legs to give the testicles a flat surface to rest on. Um, then they can kind of hold back or rest the penis um, you know, pelvic and use a folded towel to kind of cover it up, kind of serves as a belt or just covers, covers it, keeps it out of the way. And then uncover just the lower half of the patient with the sheet uh, when scanning. But always try to keep your patients completely covered until you're ready to scan. <clears throat> Patient medical history. Um, of course, we only want medical history related to the exam. If you're doing an abdomen, it doesn't matter if they had their toe amputated. We don't need every single thing, so we want to ask them a couple of things and kind of lead them, uh, give them some leading questions. Um, ask them to describe the location, onset, and duration of their pain. Um, list any recent um, imaging, they might have had other than the ultrasound, maybe they had a CT, and we might want to correlate with the CT. List any past 
diagnosis they may have. For example, they may be a diabetic. Um, list any previous surgeries, of course, in the area of concern. And any recent lab tests that might be helpful in trying to figure out what's going on. Correct imaging documentation. Okay, what's important and what has to be included on your films when imaging? You have to include, obviously, the patient's name and their identification number. Most machines will already have the date and time on the display, but again, that needs to be an accurate date and time, and it's your job to make sure that that is the case. Also, like our machines at school will say Kaiser University. Um, your machine should say whatever hospital or imaging center or institution you're working for. Their name should be somewhere on those films. Then you want to put in the name or initials of the person performing uh, the exam. That would be you. So after the patient's name, usually we include our initials so we know who did the exam. The transducer frequency and power, output power that's being used, and again, that should already be on the display. When labeling pictures and images, you always have to label the area of interest and the scanning plane. For example, sagittal gallbladder or transverse gallbladder, okay? And then the patient position only if it's not supine. So if you don't, you don't label a patient position like erect or decubitus, it is assumed that the patient is in the supine position. And then the last thing I want to cover here is the worksheet that you fill out. Um, and this can be on a computer or it can actually be on a, a piece of paper that goes along with the exam. But the date of the exam has to be included in that worksheet. The patient's demographic information, the ordering physician, the indication for the exam, any past medical history, again, related to this exam, pertinent lab or prior imaging studies and the results of those. Now, routine measurements and descriptive documentation of the pathology, um, and that's what we call technical impressions. And I'm going to be going uh, through that with you. We're going to be doing some of our discussions where I have you guys write your own technical impressions. And um, I believe it's the next PowerPoint we'll go over where I'll give you an example of how that's done, and then you'll get to practice. Notation, uh, notate any technical difficulties you might have, or say the patient uh, was in a wheelchair and they couldn't lie flat. You need to write that down or patient eight but it was ordered stat you might want to write that down in case the walls of the gallbladder look thick when in fact it was they ate um, any deviations from the normal procedure you need to document on the worksheet and name of perform performing sonographer and your credentials to follow okay um, now this there's a, this next section on common Spanish phrases. Now, I would suggest you print these out and put them on a note card. Um, but the basic phrases, and as far as testing goes, I might give you uh, a phrase such as, me nombre es. And I might say, me nombre es means and give you my name is, I'm going to do your ultrasound, all of, you know, and you pick the correct ones. So you need to be not necessarily able to pronounce it, but be able to write and know what that means in English and in Spanish. So there's like two to three pages of common Spanish phrases that you need to be familiar with. Now you could look these up on um, Google Translate and you might have a shorter version um, sometimes when we're on ground, I usually bring um, Miss Wyatt in and she goes over some other um, shorter phrases sometimes that are used. Um, and again, there's different dialect, so different um, Spanish speaking countries have different words and terms they might use. But for the most part, I would put these on a note card. 
so I would just kind of look these over. Um, you know, some of the words you could probably already make out, even if you don't have any Spanish background. So you're going to go through that and just be able to connect the, the Spanish phrase with the English phrase. I'm not going to ask you to write a phrase out in Spanish. It'll all be multiple choice. Okay, and this is the last um, page of, of Spanish terms. So like I said, you're just going to be, have to be familiar with the words and the English words. So add those to your note cards. And that's the end of the first lecture.